So as you all probably know, this is the title that Hillel sent to you and said, this is your marching order. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so he tells you what to say? <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> OK, see, this is my title of my talk. I just did exactly what you told me to do. <laughs> so actually, when, when, uh, when I saw this title, this was only about a week or so ago, because I, I don't usually look at things until <laughs> it's getting close. And so I said, oh my god, the next slide, yeah, so, so next slide. So I said, how am I going to model all of this? Look at this. I mean, look at, look at the, wait, where, are there any, no, I guess not, huh? No uh, pointer. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, 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 so it's good. It's good. So if you just look at Alzheimer's disease, for example, yeah, good. If you look at Alzheimer's disease, for example, and then there's just so many different ooh, and so many different pathology, right? You see, you can see the A beta tau, alpha synuclein, and TDP43, and how do you how do you model all of that? Um, and but before we even do that, we need to understand what is in the brain. And I think this is one of the things that that we can do. I can do particularly, you know, as you know that uh, John um, well, was a neuropathologist. And so we collaborated together, and then we um, did a lot of work together. So you see all these different pathology, and that's basically kind of what we uh, want to model, beta amyloid, tau, and Lewy body, and so on. And so the other thing that we need to consider as well when we try to model human disease is that, well, what do we know about the progression of the disease? And you can see this slide coming out of a, a review, but it was originally Brock's idea that, that um, all the, the different neurodegenerative disease proteins, and um, they undergo their typical spreading and um, as shared pathogenic mechanism among these different diseases. So today, what I'd like to do is to focus um, on uh, and, and tau tango and, and uh, alpha synuclein Lewy bodies. And so what we know about, what do we know about tau before we even started doing some of these other experiments? And we know that tau aggregates spread in human patient's brain through a neuroanatomical connectum. You heard Brad talk a lot about that already in the previous talk. And then we know that these tau, they extracted from, um, and these aggregates extracted from uh, disease brain, and they actually induce fibrillization of endogenous express tau in vitro and in vivo models. And then um, in vivo, you can passage this tau strain, and they maintain their intrinsic property. And also, you can um, generate artificial fibrillized tau uh, preformed fibrils, and they induce pathology in tau transgenic mice. And tau PF, 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 PFFs can seed tau monomers in vitro. But what is interesting is that no tau PFFs can induce major tau pathology in mouse, mouse model without overexpression. So in other words, that I consider the first generation of animal models or transgenic models where you overexpress or you put in a mutation, you kind of get the mouse to do what you want them to do. But that's unnatural. I mean, in fact, with most of the neurodegenerative diseases and only a very small fraction, I mean, maybe triplication of nucleon that really overexpress or Down syndrome. And so by and large, the majority of, 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 of neurodegenerative diseases don't have express, overexpress and, and a protein expression. So what, what we want to do is to really create models so we don't have to you know, overexpress the disease protein and we can get the pathology much like in uh, uh, patients with neurodegenerative diseases. And the other thing also that, that we um, need to solve this problem of having limitation of these brain de de human brain-derived tau seeds, because obviously the amount is limited. And even for, for tau, actually it's the most abundant pathology in neurodegenerative diseases in the sense that beta amyloid and tau, there's just so much pathology in the Alzheimer's brain. And one thing that I just want to tell you, and I want you to hopefully you remember, is that Basically, beta amyloid and tau neurofibrillary tangle are not very toxic. They're not really toxic at all. That's why you can live with Alzheimer's disease for 10, 20 years. You have a whole pet of pathology, and you're still alive. I mean, it basically, the, those pathology 
compromise the function of the neurons over time, and then eventually die. But Lewy body is different. Lewy body kills. And so that's why that you don't get a lot of, 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 of PDD patient or LBD patient with the kind of pathology that you see as plaques entangled. And so, and, um, but anyway, so this is something else that I, I just want to be sure that you get that concept. And that, that you know, that, that tau is not very toxic. And, but also that if you want to work with it, and, then, and also Brad talked about it, talked about it a little bit already. So they're batch to batch and case to case variation. And then there's time consuming and low efficiency to do sequential extraction, biochemical extraction. And then also the lack of specific ways to, to label tau C so that you can actually do some cell biology and study in mechanism. And so what we do need is to find a good way to re reliably amplify tau seeds and then test the fidelity of the amplified material and, and versus the seeds themselves, and then try to see whether we can generate an in vivo model and to validate the amplification. And so the initial, the first set of experiments we did with tau was very simple-minded. We just took some AD tau. The AD tau is pretty impure, but it's enriched. And then we basically incubated in vitro with you know, recombinant tau 40, which is the longest tau isoform, or recombinant um, and, uh, T39, which is a three repeat tau isoform. And then we shake them a little bit, and then we see whether or not that, you know, that, that these recombinant tau can be recruited by the AD tau and, and to generate some sort of fibers. Then when you re throw it into neurons, so all of our, 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 our preparation are screened by the same assay, which is basically primary mouse hippocampi neurons. They're not overexpressed, and then we just take that, those neurons that dump things on it, and then the readout is pathology. Okay, and so here you can see that um, in uh, all of this, maybe not so well, but I think that you can see that up under percent ADC, and then you can see the uh, amplification with T40 and T39, which is down here. Uh, how come it was showing? It wasn't showing before. No, sorry. Uh, here, 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 this one, yeah. So anyway, so, so these are amplified as well, and then with both T40, uh, uh, T40 and T39, and you also see amplification um, as well. And so you can amplify the, the material in vitro with recombinant tau, throw in the neurons, it works. And um, we also want to know that the, across all the AD cases, they have similar activity. So much like what, what Brad said, and here, with our four different AD cases, we're able to generate a fair amount of insoluble tau, and then these are the, what they look like. Um, and then and then we took all these four different preparations, and then we dumped them into neurons. And you can see that they all induce pathology. And uh, obviously, late stage of AD cases with a lot of tau with, has high activity. Um, so and, um, so in, in any case, so now, so what we want to do is to see whether if we can amplify the AD tau. So the way we do this is that you can take a little bit of AD tau, usually 5 to 10%, ADPHF, and then we incubate it with recombinant tau, and then we generate ADT40P1, we call it P1. And so we take out ADT40P1, and this is only 10% seed and 100% seed, and then we ask what kind of activity. And you can see that, you know, that ADT40P1 has high activity than the 10% seed, but not as high as 100% seed. So we don't understand why we couldn't get linear amplification, but that's the best we could do. Um, and so here, we also show that the material that are uh, generated here, the ADT40P1, are insoluble we can, because we can send a futures material. And then we took the soup and the pellet, the activity are all in the pellet. And then finally, we look at the pathological confirmation, and we show that, um, that, they, are all, that they all form fibrillar structures. So basically, AT, ADT40P1, we capitulated the pathological uh, genic and biophysical property of ADPHFs. And you know, what about in vivo? So basically, you can see that 10% seed ADT40P1 and 100% seed. So you can see that the ADT40P1 is closer to 100% seed than 10% seed. And it just this is some more of the Thalflavin picture, or X34. So the distribution of the um, ADT40P1 is not that that, that dissimilar from the um, ADPHF themselves. 
And so finally, and this is the last, last slide I show for ADPHF, so AD T40P1, we could re recruit both 3R and 4R tau in vivo, so very much like um, the uh, um, ADPHF. You can see here, for example, this is 4R tau, 3R tau, and then so AD T40P1 can do the same thing and as the uh, ADPHF themselves. And so that, that's really good. So basically, uh, we can amplify some of the uh, ADPHF. So what about PD? So, um, so one of the things I also want to emphasize here is that there are, you know, there are PD, PDD, and so on. But Alzheimer's disease is a major synucleinopathy. In fact, it's, it's, it's much more cases with, uh, this is synucleinopathy much you add everything up. This is only a fraction of, of Alzheimer's cases with synuclein pathology um, because there are at least tenfold more AD patients than PD and PDD patients. And so we basically work out a lot of the conditions with um, AD cases because they're so abundant. And um, so here, this is what we did was that we took a number of AD cases with a lot of uh, Lewy body, so it has a secondary neuropathological diagnosis of, of LBD and DLB, and then also the PD cases as well. So we did the same sort of, and so this is the pathology. They all have Lewy bodies, so it's AD cases and the PDD cases. And then we did the extraction. So basically, there's nothing magical about this bio, 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 biochemical extraction, fractionation of brains. Basically, what we try to do is get rid of everything and then float the myelin, and whatever left behind is kind of something that we can use. So this is kind of what we did. You, know, you centrifuge, you extract high salt and triton and detergent and float the myelin and so on. You get some stuff at the end which looks like this, okay? So it's really still pretty impure, except that you know, some of these are probably um, alpha-synuclein because they're detected by 81A and also by, um, uh, not here, but by uh, pen synuclein antibody. And the quantity is actually quite decent. And, and the next slide, which give you a little bit better idea. So for example, here, so you can see that the total synuclein is in microgram quantity and per gram tissue. So it's, it's really a fair amount to work with, okay? And whereas the PDD cases, clearly you can just see that much, much lower overall than the AD cases. And it seemed like that when there's a lot of pathology, maybe there's good neighborhood so that everybody wants to develop pathology. I don't know. But it, it just it's happened that, that AD cases really do have a lot of pathology. And you can see that they are, again, not very pure, but they're more or less similar. And so we took that material, and then we took the AD case material and PDD case material, and then we actually used low concentration, only 20 nanogram, and then we incubated for about seven days, okay? So this, this basically is important because we are using the same concentration of preformed fibers. So the preformed fibers are really basically completely in vitro, recombinant bacteria, recombinant and synuclein protein, and then we shake them and then generate some fiber. In fact, you can shake them many different ways. You may be able to generate fibers with, with slightly different potency. But this particular, uh, uh, the way that we generated these PFF at 20 nanogram for one week, you can see that there's nothing. Whereas for these other cases, you can see Lewy body, like inclusions. So that at least what this showed is that, you know, that, that the human derived cases are much more biologically active than the preformed fibers. And what we did here was so we just did some, you know, just look at different concentration. You can see that it, it does respond in the sense that the more material you add, the more Lewy body that you have. We just increase the concentration of this um, and uh, AD alpha synuclein Lewy body. And, um, and, but at the same time, if you use now 10 times small concentration of PFF, you can see the morphology are very different. Okay, look at this. This is really mostly neuritic pathology. There are few cell bodies. There are few, occasionally you can see some, but very few. Now, if you look back here, this is mostly cell body. Okay, so right away the PFF and the Lewy body and, and derived from, from uh, human brain are different. And so this is just a quantification. You can see the PFF, so the percentage of soma and, uh, and PFF induce very small number, whereas the AD cases and the DLB cases induce a lot of cell body pathology. And so 
and then we wanted to see whether we can amplify this more. So what we did was that we did the same thing as what, what I just showed you. We took a little bit, 5% of the seed with the monomer, agitate, and then we take this, and P, this is P1, and then we do it again, and we generate P2. In theory, you should be able to do it over and over and over and over again. So by doing this amplification procedure with monomers, and then you're diluting your contaminants more and more. So hopefully, eventually, you get a preparation that have very little contaminant. And also, by doing this, you can probably expand it to a lot of material. So my idea would be to amplify so that we can, I can send it to everybody and who wants to use them for the experiment. And um, so that would be, you know, and really be helpful to the field. And so now we took the um, uh, material, and the, this is now the P1. And uh, um, so this is AD1 and AD. PD, so it's all the same. It's different again from PFF. So this is all we want to remember is that when you use Lewy body, you always get Lewy body and um, pathology. When you use PFF, you don't get the same thing. And again, so this is quantification. Again, the SOMA, uh, uh, eight, the AD cases, the P1 cases, AD1, two, three different um, AD cases that the P1 and also the DLB P1, they all behave similarly. And so this is, what about P2? So the P2, again, is kind of boring. It's, we can reproduce ourselves. So ADP2, AD1P2, AD1, and this is PDD1P2. So basically, all show the same specificity. And what about other characteristics of, of the, the material? Um, so ba basically, what we show here is that this Louis body um, material induced pathology, they're ubiquinated. And they're also uh, P62 positive, so they're, sent, they're being sent to the lysosomes. And also that we want to know whether or not the AD Lewy body are the same or different from the PDD Lewy body using more actually sensible, more, you know, and, and uh, sensitive methods to see whether we can see them. So here what we did what that was that we tried to um, uh, 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 digest them with protein SK to see whether or not the the fragments that are generated after putting this K digestion between AD and uh, Lewy body and PD, D, Lewy body, whether they're different or the same, but basically they're the same. So the AD, Lewy body, you can see the whole series of bands, of about five, six bands, which is similar to the PDD cases, but they are different from the PFF. You can see the PFF here, which is really kind of three major bands in a different proportion as these. So basically what we showed here is that um, and the AD, Lewy body and the PDD Lewy body, at least based on a couple of these assays, they're similar. And um, we didn't really see any difference with the behavior of, of either of them as we were working on them uh, with the cells and also with the animals as well. So here, what we did was that we took the amplified Lewy body and then we take human PFF and then we inject it into wild type mice. And you can see that the amplified Lewy body and have more um, these cell body inclusion than the p human PFF, although that they all develop the pathology in the same uh, brain region, pretty much. If you look at where the yellow and the orange is, it's, it's more or less similar between the two. So the conclusion of this part of my talk is that pathological synuclein from patient-derived Lewy bodies induce pathology that's distinct from that induced by PFFs in our culture neuron model. Furthermore, Lewy body uh, alpha synuclein more potent than PFFs and seeding alpha synuclein aggregate in hippocampi neurons. And that Lewy body aggregates can be amplified in vitro using recombinant alpha synuclein, generating aggregates that maintain the unique pathological phenotypes of the original material from diseased brains. And the amplified Lewy bodies in induce alpha synuclein pathology in several brain regions in wild type mice, and that the spread of pathology induced by amplified Lewy body aggregates which is, is the same, I've said that already. So basically, I think that we think that Lewy body alpha synuclein aggregate elicited a unique cellular response that are not that different and, uh, from uh, fully recombinant fibers. And this is the people who did the work. And uh, Jahan, Ara, and Nick Morata did the synuclein work. Sneha, Narasimhan, and Hong Su Jingwo did the, um, uh, the Tao work. And the work was done in collaboration with John Trichinowski. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Virginia. Questions? No, you're stretching or you're... <laughs>
Thank you for the talk. Do you have some structural information on your PFFs versus the patient material? Whether Not that's the, PFF, the same strains or the, or the, the Lewy same body or the PFFs? The PFF and the, the patient PFFs. material. No, the alpha synuclein one. The alpha synuclein model. And uh, we are in the process of doing some of that now. I mean, we definitely have, you know, um, a structure of, of PFF. Um, you know, uh, fibrils, and it was done many years ago. And the newer ones, I think we, we, we're doing some of that now with from, from Lewy body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, uh, very, very interesting. Um, Kastan keeps bothering me about this problem of propagation. And it seemed to me that uh, you have the information, at least to give us uh, a constraint on it, a uh, quantitative constraint on it. Can you tell us? How rapidly this front of, uh, uh, of um, uh, aggregation propagates in the brain of the mice in, say, some dimensionless units, you know, like one cell you, per you inject, day? depending on how much you inject. And initially, we, we thought it would take a while. So we didn't even look at them until after about a month. And then, you know, and then more recently, and um, it, we've been injecting them and looking at them like after five days. And, and five days or so, you'll really see a little bit. It seemed like that it, it shows up, and then it's sort of like that they don't do very much for a while. And then all of a sudden, it started taking off after a month or so. So basically, they, um, the synuclein pathology may peak, maybe. It keeps going up even six months, nine months, and peak I mean, maybe that, six months. That's nine interesting months. in the sense that that's like the famous you know, incubation period that exists right. in, the in vivo. Right in vitro experiments, but right. it'd just be great to have a number of, you know, this feature of the aggregation goes so many cell body lengths per uh, replication, so nucleation time. I think yeah, be a great it, it, may, it may be difficult to really, uh, course, you know, put, because of the fact that, box. you know, the, 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 the start material are very variable. I think that you have to amplify it to see whether or not they're kind of more or less the same ballpark in terms of, you know, specific activity. And then you can start asking those questions because there's too many variables just in the system itself. No, when we take end stage brain, we take end stage brain. So we, you know, in fact, if anybody can say to you that they can actually do a time course on human brains, I think they're they're unrealistic because it's just so there's so so much variability. You know, the age of onset is different from from different individuals, and the course of the disease are different. And so we just take end stage Alzheimer's brain, and we just you know, look for pathology, those that have a lot of Lewy body, and those are the ones that we take for the extraction. Right. Yeah, and in fact, you know, we, we, we've done a lot of these, you know, control experiment, and, and I would have to say that, you know, our AD Lewy body uh, material has tau in it. Okay, you saw that. I mean, I, I, I showed the, the Western blood, and, but they don't seem to interfere. They don't seem to amplify, the, they don't seem to interfere. Thanks, Virginia. That's very, very clear. I wanted to ask you, I was amazed that you can amplify your synuclein aggregates and get them to breed true with recombinant protein. I suppose I had a, a thought and a question. So the yes, thought sure. was, given that your recombinant protein has no post-translational modifications, mm -hmm. does that mean that post-translational modifications are irrelevant for spreading and aggregation in the cell? Or do they, the fibrils then, the pre do they pick up the post-translation modifications in situ? Yeah, so, so I think that post-PTMs do matter, but they're not like on and off switch. They sort of modify. And we actually have a paper um, that has been just submitted on, on PTMs and how PTMs affect, you know, and uh, uh, synuclein 
and uh, um, ag aggregation and in, in Lewy body and also in GCI uh, and, and MSA, yeah. So they do, they do matter. Have you looked at the, the fibrils that you've generated after they've been in the cell and then mapped the PTMs and are they the same or different from yeah. the ones so, formed in so, the brain? Yeah, so, so, you know, so we need to do that with, with animals and then we need to be sure that we have enough material because of the fact that the, whatever we use to the AD, you know, w whatever you use for cell culture and for mouse brain, it's nothing compared with human brain. That's one of the reasons why you guys should work with human brain, because there's tons of material. Each brain is a thousand grams. Even an Alzheimer's brain is eight, nine hundred grams. And a normal brain is 1200 grams. A mouse brain is half a, half a gram to a gram. And so, you know, so there's a, just a lot of, lot of material to work with for, 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 uh, for human material. And if you extract them, and at, at least for us in the end stage, you always look kind of the same. My other quick question was, have you looked to see whether the fibrils you generate by several rounds of elongation yeah, yeah. propagation, whether that structure is actually changing? I mean, the whole field is know. really worried about yeah. whether you amplify the more readily amplified materials. Yeah, uh, you, we don't know. You're absolutely right. Although that we do know that if we, let's say that we take the P1s, you know, just to base, take the, take the uh, brain extract stuff, and then amplify that, that would be P1. And we know that P1 to P2, the P2 is active for synuclein. For tau, we're not sure, because tau is more complicated. Just the fact that the six tau isoform it is more complicated. Just to, to follow up on the, the, do, the PTMs yeah. do matter. In other words, we have also through the work with Matt Pratt, and we have other work and other where we can show that certain post-aggregation PTM can abolish seeding activity. In the neuronal model, when you seed with PFF, the new reformed fibrils will have a lot of the PTMs that are in the brain, yeah. like the yeah. truncation, yeah. phosphorylation, uh, P62, uh, yeah. exact... But, 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 but the whole system, she's using just the regular proteins, right? Yeah, yeah, her. yeah. So what we've done is the same experiment. If we isolate the fibrils from the neurons and we seed with those, they are much more potent than the yeah. recombinant, yeah. but they still seed. Yeah. I think what I was intrigued by is, the, is this sort of directly to cell body, because normally we yeah. see the topography of neuritic and over time the transition to cell body and compactness. And here, so I was wondering whether because when we add the fibrils to the cell, actually 100% of the fibrils are cleaved at residue 114 within 24 one days. So the internalized fibrils are processed very differently from the newly formed fibrils. Right, right, so right. I was wondering, since when you add the human material, yeah. whether that, uh, they're processed differently, that they don't go. Yeah, you know, to I, we don't know, because the material is a little s slow. You know, we add 0.5 micrograms, so I don't yeah. know whether or not, you know, um, we can recover enough to be able to see. Yeah. Thank you, Virginia. That Thank was you. great. Yeah.